You mean the infographic? Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm not set up. Uh, I don't have the paperwork at, at my fingertips, but I'll just say briefly, uh, you can be very creative with it. I've already had, uh, I've had, no, I don't know, about 10, so turn it in. Uh, and it's just uh, to give you practice. Uh, I wasn't anticipating a virus outbreak when I signed it originally, but uh, I, I like avenues to always in, in pump up grades. So uh, any topic, any vir viral disease that you want to cover, and I'm, I'm going to even open it up to any bacterial or viral disease. And the, the task is, is to, to write a infographic or a chart that discusses that disease. It cuts to the chase as a graphic. And that's what infographics do. And CDC and I, online, I have a bunch of examples for you. But there's free software out there that can help you lay it out, or you can just put graphics and text in a Word document and do it that way if you want. Nothing okay. fancy. Uh, but the idea is you're going to have to communicate sometimes wellness topics for patients. You know, do this and that and these and those. I'm sure that's going on now for the virus. And uh, so I'm going to leave it up to you to be creative. All I'm looking for is conveying some information about a particular disease and uh, explaining it a little bit, what a patient could do to prevent from getting it, that sort of thing. And it's just, it's info uh, uh, chart. It just it gives a little bit of information. I'll be very flexible about it. But it's an authentic skill um, to do those things. You're gonna be asked to do them from time to time. Um, so if you're out walking anytime and on a trail and you see a little sign that don't feed the ticks, that would be my little note that I posted on trees, <laughs> uh, warning you against uh, uh, Borrelia burgdorferi or Lyme disease. And uh, my dad had that, so I, I feel pretty strong about it. So uh, everyone does it in the healthcare profession, uh, do, doing info charts, and I wanted you to have that. Does that, does that help? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and it's it's designed for uh, really just to having that experience. Uh, let's see. When does that need to be turned in? No, uh, up until the very last uh, day uh, after the final. I mean, you can turn it in at the time of the final, at the end of that testing period if you want. Is it still partner, or is yeah. it? Are we doing individual? You can do it individual or partnered. I'm real flexible about it. Okay. Yep. Uh, I, I tend to lean towards partnered because that's the way it will be in the real world. But it doesn't matter for this. It's, it's however you can get it done uh, and get the credit for it. Now, if you don't do it, it will not count against you. Okay? It's just uh, I'm allowed to be flexible at this, this period of time. And it's really designed to help boost grades. It's really kind of what it is. Oh, wow. yeah, and so that's it. But if if uh, those who you know haven't turned it in, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, hurt their grade for that. I just I don't think I should do that. All right. Okay. Perfect. Thanks. Sure. Now um, the lab practical is going to cover, um, and I hope everyone has to see this is sideways. Now I got to change this. Uh, the camera's at a weird angle, so I got to do the best I can here. Yeah, that's kind of how it's going to be going. If that makes any sense to you. Is that all right? Yes. Yeah. All right. So I have to write sideways, so my handwriting will probably improve. Um, we have uh, all these units that we did. That's what's on there. It's not comprehensive like final. Oh, while I'm on that topic, and I pull however many I've got one waiting. Uh, Mr. Vinyl? Yeah. Um, will it be, um, how will the lab practical be set up? Will it be multiple choice? Will it be? Yeah. It, it'll be all multiple choice. And the reason I chose the check mark or whatever the name of the software is, it allows me uh, to embed graphics. Okay. And that way uh, you'll have a better experience. And the graphics that I will use will be pristine. In other words, there won't be any um, weirdness about the uh, the test or whatever. It'll be straightforward. And um, I, I want to do that uh, to make sure everyone has to... Uh, now, somebody is waiting here. Uh, hopefully, they can get in. 
the bandwidth here at my home is just terrible. So that's uh, that's what we're covering, and and, and that's in the of course the uh, lab practical review. And all it is is the summation from the lab manual, and some of you may or may not have your manuals with you, so I, that's why I, I kind of did it this way. Uh, one of the things I wanted to make uh, I, hopefully a, a little bit clearer is these tests, especially in this section, this is all about identifying bacteria and how we do that in a clinical lab and the test. And what's nice about that is everything has a certain basis or the, characteristically they're the same in terms of the approach how we do that. And so we, we're looking for gram-positive COXI, uh, the staph, and then the strep. And then we uh, did a, uh, the major being able to distinguish between those two is really all that is. And then we moved into the gram-negatives. And it's, it's Sherlock Holmes type stuff. And what I mean by that, uh, this is a graphic you probably haven't seen, which is all right if I can balance it somehow, it's, it doesn't make sense on how it's arranged, so there it is. Uh, it, it's sort of like a, a, a multi-part tree, I'm trying to figure it out, and all it is, is I, I picked this graphic because you do a gram stain, so usually in a diagnostic lab, the very first thing that we do is we put the strains, the clinical strains, right on uh, blood auger. Now, that's not totally true. We put it on uh, a selective media first sometimes. Some laboratories, hospitals do this, uh, they'll put it on blood auger first. And blood auger is not selective, it's only differential. And I'm saying the reason I don't do it that way, you're asking for trouble because you're going to get all sorts of stuff when you get a clinical sample. But right now we're not worried about that. So usually in a hospital setting they'll go beta, alpha, or gamma in terms of that. And then they'll take bacteria uh, that shows up beta or bad, you know, the ones with a really clear zone around it. They'll gram stain it and see if it's a gram negative or gram positive. And then they'll run catalase test. And if you remember, uh, that helps. This is a gram negative bacillus and this is a gram, uh, um, yeah, gram positive bacilli uh, or coxy. And uh, let's take the coxy example. You've got a gram positive. You run the catalase test, then you already know that you're kind of heading down the staff, if you recall. I, I made a big deal about if it's a positive catalase because the, the thing that we have trouble identifying is the strep. And it's always negative on the catalase. So this type of test is what they call a presumptive test, and it helps. Uh, guide us as to what type of testing we're going to do after that. Does that make sense? And so in the lab what we've done because of the time constraints is that we kind of have you just do uh, We give you the strains that are we told told you were staff and within the staff uh, you, you test the catalase you see that it's positive and then you run uh, maybe a coagulase test or uh, the antibiotic test various others to help pin it down and so what you're doing is sort of making a tree and you, you test until it branches. And so you're on your way to identify the organism. Overall, that's all we're doing through all of these different labs here is uh, we're creating different types of tests for that. Does that make sense? So we just do the branch uh, philosophy on that. So, Dr. B, do yeah. we have that chart? Is that in oh, our lab book? Oh, oh, um, when I do the uh, voiceover on this, um, so I'll give you the uh, YouTube, and attached to it will be the revised document that I actually used in my voiceover, and it'll contain this and this plot here for you. Okay. And I'll be glad to post them separately, too, so you, you don't have to download all of it. Dr. Uh, B? Yeah. When you say that we're going to be identifying organisms, is it going to be as specific as E. coli or more along the lines of is it staph or strep? Yeah, I'll give you a kind of a clue if it's a, um, that's a really good question because uh, it's important to know that we're doing um, the uh, gram negative 
rods, the GNR. And so you'll be told that it's a GNR type. So you can kind of shift gears to know it's GNR, which will be your gram negative bacteria. Okay. If there is, now, if the, the question is determining between staph or strep, that'll be obvious in the question. Okay. But if Thank it's you. identifying a staph. Now, uh, the, the test really, this, the, the lab practical will be really testing your ability to analyze the actual test that you're doing. Is it a positive test or negative? Branching it as far as determining which organism it is, uh, I provide charts for that. Okay. And so it's just kind of following through being a detective and looking at the test and comparing it and matriculating through that little branch. And, uh, and that is a, the most common part of any diagnostic lab is doing that. And oddly enough, a lot of students uh, are frustrated from the standpoint that they're not used to uh, detective work like that. And that's a typical diagnostic laboratory function. So uh, I, that's why I try to overemphasize that. I hope that makes sense to you. So now uh, what I typically do for each of the sections here is I talk about the organism. So there's a little background or dossier of the organisms that we typically worry about in a clinical setting uh, for a particular topic. So in this case, this is the staff, and we're looking uh, at characteristics. And we always try to group these pathogens in terms of tests that we can run. And that's why we do this. The coagulase is a really easy test to do, um, assuming that uh, you get a fresh uh, a reagent. But coagulase, uh, uh, coagulates positive or coagulates negative separates is it staph aureus or uh, the one that we wor worry about really is uh, saprophyticus and sa uh, staphylococcus aureus. Aureus is, is the bad boy on the block. This would be a beta on a, a blood auger plate. Saprophyticus will be too. Uh, and not always. This, this one this one can be a, a, a difficult one clinically, but I don't have you worry about that. So the test will be clear and you can identify which staff based on the branching. Uh, you just need, uh, coagulase is an enzyme. Any word that ends in ASC is an enzyme. It catalyzes a reaction. And uh, th things that coagulate, it's like opening the top of superglue. The enzyme actually opens the top and then it starts to solidify. And students like that analogy because it, it kind of puts into perspective. So organisms that have the catalase tend to cause a gel to form with the clotting factors. And their idea, and it's totally theoretical, the reason why they do that is to try to prevent the immune system from coming in to clear it, and it thickens everything up. And so staph has this ability. It's one of the reasons why MRSA is around a long time. Staph, it's a um, methicillin resistant staph aureus, is it does that, is one of the theories anyhow. The negatives uh, don't produce it and every it, coagulase doesn't affect the clotting type factors. And so aureus has developed or evolved that unique characteristic. Uh, so epidermidis is pretty common. It's on the surface, various things. You can see that, you can read through it. Saprophyticus, a uh, big factor is UTIs, uh, cystitis, uh, and unfortunately bad technique in terms of catheterization stuff in retirement homes and things. Uh, Staph aureus is really, this is the bad boy. This unfortunately uh, is what you're gonna see most of the time. Uh, I hate to say how much money uh, insurance companies have paid for infections caused by this. It's huge. It's, it's a terrible problem. Simulans, on the next page, uh, it's a normal flora, but um, every now and then it can be found on medical devices, anything that we put into a body. And if we didn't clear the organisms from the device, and which is really hard because a lot of prosthetics now have this amazing laser etching that allows the tissue to kind of meld into the metal, the titanium, Unfortunately, it gives nooks and crannies for organisms to kind of dig in, and it's hard to sometimes to, to get them all autoclaved and killed. 
And that's what they mean by that. Simulants can do that and they camp and then all of a sudden they come in and uh, cause a problem. And there are also wounds, um, of burn patients typically. Um, simulants, you know, if you were to ask me, I'd say, ah, you know, we don't see that very often. But that's not true in burn patients. You see pretty much everything. So the staph can cause uh, pyogenic infections that puts the uh, pimple popper lady on TV and a, a job. Uh, anything that produces the pus, pyogenic. And uh, a lot of this the pus is the uh, remnants of the immune system that's trying to clear it. And you see that. Um, but what they're really famous for are its exotoxins. They cause, it's called a skin syndrome in children when they're born. They look like the mother's mistreated the baby and tried to burn it or whatever. And it, they actually, uh, it was a bad history on that stuff. But it, it's just a, a toxin that produces a defoliant sort of like uh, an agent for skin. It kills it. And for children, because their skin's so rapidly growing, it won't leave any permanent scars, but uh, means that we have to make sure that we get rid of the staph. It killed a lot with toxic shock syndrome. Uh, one co company, A. H. Robbins, actually went out of business uh, because of that, uh, with the uh, tampons and things. That, that was a disaster. People dying from it, and they knew it, and they, they didn't do anything about it, which is just is beyond belief. Uh, staphylococcal food poisoning, this is the biggie. While you're in there celebrating, or you're in a church or something, and you've got just a potato salad sitting outside waiting for everyone to come out. Well, four hours, uh, three hours of sitting on food, they're sitting there and they're putting uh, these exotoxins all over it. And you eat the food and about four hours later, you wish the hell you didn't have it uh, because you'll be nausea, vomiting, and it's usually four hours. You can almost set your watch to it. And that's usually part of the diagnosis in triage. So I ask, you know, how long or what did you eat and that sort of thing. Uh, so staph is famous for that. And then you get into the methicillin resistant infections. This, this is a biggie. Uh, you're going to see so much of this stuff. It's a, usually it's a wound that won't resolve. You, you, put, you put creams and stuff on it and it's still there. And you see it a lot in community acquired type of MRSAs. Uh, you can see it in hospitals, but you know, hospitals, you see the patient until they're on the point where they're recuperating and they're gone. And then they go into some sort of, uh, well, uh, a treatment center for a while. And that's where you usually see it show up and it just persists for weeks and weeks and uh, never goes away and gets usually worse. And um, you see it a lot in gyms and dorms and things. But uh, anyhow, I, I just wanted to point that out. And that's why we study this stuff is... Uh, we want to identify these as quickly as we, we can because we want uh, to be able to uh, to notify um, healthcare uh, workers and things uh, to the presence of it. Uh, the diagnostics is key. Uh, so we use selective media and differential medias. And again, just to review it, selective allows us uh, to get rid of organisms to kind of bring it down to usually from gram negative to gram positive. That's what we're trying to do. So we're keeping as much as we can all gram positive. We'll screen for that, and then we'll screen uh, for the gram negatives if we have to. And that's usually what they do in a diagnostic. The differential media is usually playing to their metabolic activity, and the differentials uh, have the bacteria essentially identify themselves to you just by the nature of the way they are in the way they deal with uh, different sugars and things like that. And we use the differentials to really identify these organisms and using that tree thing I was talking about. Uh, I, I have, by the way, put various YouTubes uh, throughout. If, if there's a topic that, that you're not uh, feeling comfortable about, I welcome you to do Google searches and try to find some YouTubes if you uh, want to, but um, a lot of times we still rely heavily on gram staining. I don't know how many advanced laboratories with all their automated testing. Usually uh, folks in the diagnostics, they want to have physical proof of the microorganisms. So that's what worries me about this COVID-19. 
because, you know, they're not really isolating the virus. They're using PCR these days. And, uh, boy, that scares me. I want to see it. <laughs> I want physical proof. And that's just the way I am and it's the way I was taught. And uh, I, I just can't, I, I can't conceive of flying by my seat of my pants. But anyhow, staff, uh, grape white clusters, it's the preponderance of that. Uh, if you're giving only a few, which you won't have that choice, so I, I'll give you slides that have that preponderance so you can kind of see the grape white clusters everywhere. Uh, and that's so characteristic of staff. And again, the catalase uh, is always positive. It, it bubbles right away uh, for the staff. Um, and all staff produce this, not just staff aureus or anything. It's, it, I always kept a bottle of uh, H2O2 in my pocket, and I could ma make a presumptive right away. Uh, I did this at the veterinary hospital all the time. We'll go ahead and start treating the animal uh, because it's a gram-positive staff, and I know that because I made a presumptive. It, 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 under the microscope, it looked like that, and uh, it was positive on the catalase and uh, allow us to move right away. Um, and then the straps are catalase negative, and that makes it nice. So if I saw negative and then I didn't see the clusters and I saw chains, then we start treating for strep type infections. And in animals, that's a huge thing. Humans is not so much. It's uh, we kind of we treat them just gram positives across the board. Uh, mannitol salts is selective and differential. What's nice is that it's got the high salt in there, and the gram negatives can't deal with it and it's differential, so we're looking for its, its ability to utilize mannitol, and so that's really, really nice and helpful. So uh, on a lab practical uh, MSA, what makes it selective is this 7.5% salt, so that's how we make it selective, and um, allows the growth of the staff, and, and then the presence of a pH indicator, phenol red, and that's a very common one. So if you forgot on a particular test and one of them's listing a phenol red, uh, nine times out of 10, that's what they use. <laughs> I'm not saying not to study, but uh, in the stress of the things, that's usually a good guess. Uh, and so it produces acid during the fermentation. So that's key to a lot of these tests is that when they break down the sugar, they produce an acid and then we have a pH indicator and it just changes the chemical structure a little bit so it rotates light in a different um, a frequency of the color and we see yellow which is really nice it's useful and it's, uh, the bacteria are doing all the identification for us uh, really we just it's revealing it uh, to us and so fermentation is um, pretty key does that make sense okay um the hemolysis patterns uh, again, staff is a little bit different from uh, strep, and it's one thing you can use, and this plate doesn't really show it as well, but I could read the newspaper through a beta plate. That will be so clear, it's, it's, it's amazing. You can see a little bit of it there, but a strap will be muddled. In other words, it's not crystal clear, and it, although it's clearly a beta, where it clears it, uh, so the strap will tend to be a little muddled where the staff is just clear as a bell, and it's nice. It's just one of those little things. I'm not going to ask you that, but it, hopefully you put that in your pocket because it'll help you uh, if you ever have to deal with this stuff. So beta, alpha, and gamma. Beta is bad. Alpha is weird because it really deals on the fact that the organism is producing uh, hydrogen peroxide. So it's causing the uh, red blood cells with the iron, the heme group, to rust and it rust green and that's what you're seeing and um, they talk about uh, meth hemoglobin all that is is the oxidized version of it and it gives us that greenish hue and it, I like to look at it, hey if it's ox it's rusting <laughs> and turns green if I leave a, an organism on a, a blood auger plate long enough for days and days and days it will turn green because all organisms produce hydrogen peroxide to some extent but uh, the true alpha 
hemolysis will do it overnight and you'll see the greenish shoes. So you hold the plate up and you see a really dark kind of smear and uh, you might see it. So you can see the greens. Did they put an antibiotic disc there? That's why I like that plate. Because you can see where it is, the positive part of it, and it's clear because it killed, that antibiotic killed all the organisms. So you can see the difference, uh, but that's clearly alpha. And it'll have a dark and green type hue to it. You got to know the age of the plate. If it's old, old plate, it can give you a false positive. And I've been tricked so many times, it's, it's embarrassing. Gamma is boring. Gamma, you look on a gamma, and the bacteria growing on it, that's, that's fine and dandy, but it's not doing anything to the blood auger unless you let it sit for days and days and days at room temperature. And they'll produce some hydrogen peroxide. And so, but uh, any plates that I show in the lab practical will be pristine. And if you don't see any reaction on blood auger's gamma, if you see really clear through its beta, beta is bad, and the bad boys are the ones that do that. And it's really why we use this test. Alpha just kind of came up. I just read the history on using blood augers, and alpha was sort of a, a side reaction. It wasn't one that was really recorded. All they were looking for was this, but now they can differentiate the gamma and alphas. Nova biasin. Um, Staph saprophyticus uh, is a uh, uropathogen, as I already mentioned in previous. And uh, it's innately resistant to novobiosin. So the novobiosin is a uh, chromosomal resistance, which is not very common in bacteria. It's usually the extra chromosomal inheritance like plasmids and things. And we use the novobiosin. So if you see the word novobiosin being used in the test, just know that all we're doing is looking for saprophyticus. What's not saprophyticus is sensitive, okay? So the resistant that pins that one out. Saprophyticus is a bear to identify. And uh, this, this was discovered and so Nova is used repeatedly for that. I hope that you can see that. So there's Nova bias and there's sensitive and resistant. And uh, I, I hope everyone remembers how we did that. So I threw this in here just to refresh. We uh, put this that had antibiotic on it and you kind of tap them on the plate and then you measure them later. Uh, if you're doing a, a, a standard uh, testing to see which antibiotic to use, but in a test like this, it's, it, we don't have to measure it. It's uh, either it's resistant or it's sensitive. Uh, it's one of the two. The coagulase test, if you remember, a positive test, it coagulates, so you can tip the tube sideways and it's still stuck at the bottom. And that's like opening the cap of a, a super glue. It immediately hardens within seconds, and that's what happens here. And negatives is still fluid, and it may or may not see that as well, but uh, that's what the graphics depicting. And that's why we like it. It's a simple and it's a reliable test. And uh, so, anyhow, that's what that's about. Now, uh, I usually make a big deal about separating staph from the strep. And just remember, uh, catalase positive, catalase negative. And so uh, we isolate the strep. And I have a YouTube video. I, I pick ones that I, they follow good aseptic technique and protocol. They use gloves, they use everything that's right. Uh, these are hard to find. <laughs> Usually they're doing it wrong. Um, so the strap or gram positives, they're facultative ana uh, anaerobes, so they can grow pretty much. They tend to grow slow, uh, but they, uh, the bacteria like to kind of grow in pairs or chains. So usually when you look at it under a microscope, you might see two kind of budding cells together. They tend to stick the way they separate or divide. And uh, so in the dividing plane, uh, so they may continue and you'll get a chain and it's just because they divide that way You'll get a chain and so that helps us either. It's sort of doubles boards and chains and that helps us identify so let's look at some of the clinically important ones uh, strep pneumonia uh, It's a normal inhabitant uh, of the human upper respiratory tract and um, pneumonia, anytime, of course, pneumonia, it, it, 
earn its name uh, because it's a facultative uh, anaerobe it still likes to grow it prefers to grow in high oxygen environments but it can go deeper in the lung because the oxygen tension gets lower it doesn't it doesn't care and that's why this one's really suited for that environment um, so well it kind of goes in there um, and they also produce a slimy surface so they're pretty uh, shiny colonies when you look at them and uh, so they uh, they cause pneumonia ear infections and uh, meningitis uh, it's not as is uh, uh, common meningitis. Uh, Diplococci, sometimes we see it uh, as Diplococcus, but uh, uh, they're really dense and sometimes they can fool you because you'll see two and then another set are kind of stuck to it um, because for whatever reason. And it might appear as a chain, but they're not. They're, they're, they, they're Diplococcus. Pyogenes, uh, group A strep. This is a bad boy. This is a tough, this is what most diagnostic labs fear when they get samples in. Uh, the pyogenes, if you uh, looked at the case study, uh, flesh-eating bacteria and stuff like that, this is, this is a bad boy. This is nasty. And it's getting worse, it seems like. Associated with strep throat, and we're seeing uh, children with strep throat that are getting bilateral numbness in the feet and hands. Scary. Uh, and it's toxin, and they've acquired some other nasty characteristics, and uh, I'm following that. It's uh, pretty scary. Necrotizing fasciitis, that's the flesh-eating bacteria. This is a bad. So it has these toxins that it's like radiation. If you've ever studied or followed a patient that's been exposed to radiation, they're fine for a little while. They've gotten the dose, or you've gotten the bacterial infection, and the cells are dying, and they don't know it yet. And then by the time they recognize that uh, they got a problem, it's too late. And so usually a patient that has necrotizing fasciitis, usually the next call a, a physician will make is to a surgeon, and they cut it out, and it's bad. Not common, nor, normal flora. Um, a small percentage of people uh, will carry it in the respiratory tract, if you can believe that. And it really depends on where they work and how old they are. Agalacti is typically known as group B strep. So when I was in school, we had to know the name and the, and the grouping because we, we knew that. And it tells you the type of pathogen. I'm, I'm not worried about that. The only one that I want you to know about is the group A strep because everyone does that. And we actually ran a test with the group A. Uh, it's pretty easy to do. It's like a, uh, um, a pregnancy test. It, it's a uh, latex type test. It's really easy to run. Uh, let's see. So agalacti, inhabitant of the gastrointestinal tract and the urinary tract. Uh, some not as common uh, opportunistics, usually what we see. And the problem with this one, though, is once they get in the door, uh, they don't have any problem with calling, uh, causing sepsis, and then they also can uh, perform a unique uh, trick. And once they get into the circulatory system, they start to cause pneumonia, and uh, that's that's a problem. Uh, I study diseases in newborns, and I used a chicken, and believe it or not, as a, as a model for that. And uh, the agalacti is nasty little, it's sneaky. It's just sneaky, and. Um, it can have a passage uh, through the uh, birth canal and causes uh, infections of the blood tissue. And uh, it has been reported in adults, but we typically see it in children. And I, I, I just wanted to show again the antibiotic sensitivity tests and, and that sort of thing. It's, you've already known that. That was actually part of Lab Practical One. Um, but we do use that test, but in a different way. Just either they do or they don't, and you don't have to worry about measuring it for that. Um, salivarius, common microflora. Uh, this is a problem for those who are on the dental path, uh, brushing and, and flossing the teeth. Um, the, the, it can do a 
transient type of septicemia and it can cause because the antigens are similar as we're studying the um, immune system and it cross reacts so it has an epitope uh, that emulates the uh, cardi the epicardia and you start creating a uh, immune response against it that could be a problem and also just inflammation of the uh, muscle uh, plaque formation on teeth and they're starting to think I don't know if you've read this but uh, the formation of plaque seems to be correlated uh, with a particular uh, salivarius uh, with Alzheimer's and I thought that was really strange right? Um, so it's a gum disease that there is a precursor to uh, at least one of the indicators of what do they call that uh, co-committant type of thing. They can, they're associating with uh, folks with that terrible disease. Uh, very forgetful. Uh, Enterococcus uh, fas fas uh, fasciitis, uh, fecal, sorry, I'm reading sideways. Um, it used to be streptococcus fecalis. And the enterococcus is, is different. Uh, usually it's one that's in the, uh, uh, the gastrointestinal tract. And so they renamed it from just strep to the enterococcus. So it gives it a little bit better of a, it's a normal flora of the gut associated with opportunistic type of urinary infections. And uh, what they're also finding is that these help shuttle uh, genetics between dissimilar organisms. So they're working in the background uh, to pass antibiotic resistance to different organisms. And so they really started to, to be looking for this one because it's a troublemaker. And uh, why they have that characteristic, I don't know what they're getting out of it. But they're getting something. So there's a typical gram stain of a uh, strep. And you can see the chains. And you can see how long the chains are. That's the kind of the, uh, you look at the preponderance. And if you notice that they're snaking around and that sort of stuff, it's clearly chains. And uh, it makes it easy to, to identify it. So you, you know, still want to look at the preponderance of the, or, of the organism, but uh, this really reveals itself. Normally, if it's just pairs, doublets, you'll see just blotches of those uh, like that. And uh, that's not the case. This is clearly changed. So, yeah, the hemolytic patterns, uh, alpha, the partial results in the greenish color, if you remember, it's the same. Uh, but that's for the uh, uh, one of the breakdowns here. So, I have this chart that shows the partial or alpha hemolysis, beta, complete hemolysis and agalacti and pyogenes. And those are the two bad boys I've already identified. And so that's why uh, a lot of the hospitals will screen using blood because if they get the, um, the strep, uh, they don't waste time. So everything is about time. And the longer someone's exposed to a pathogen, the more damage is being done. So you can appreciate that. No hemolysis or the, the boring gamma. Uh, bovis and enterococcus and just don't underestimate the enterococcus uh, because they can be they can be bad and uh, so they they can grow in high salt they uh, have uh, uh, really pretty pretty high tolerance of like osmotic shock for whatever reason but uh, that the dr. Lansfield that worked up the groupings of these because they were such pathogens nasty pathogens especially in children and she was amazing in the 1920s and 30s and worked out uh, the grouping and uh, she rubbed shoulders with a top chemical uh, or the, the chemists from around the world the, the world's leaders it's amazing the work that she did it's still valid today all of her work and typically we only use the group a strep for, for the uh, throat but uh, hospitals will work and use the group B uh, and others so you can get um, agalacti which is a bad boy and group D the enterococcus and um, and sometimes they use others but all you need to worry about uh, for the lab practice is group A and we used the rapid uh, strep test and I got a YouTube that kind of goes over that test because I think uh, we we didn't have the lab on this one and it's really easy to use. You just put the bacteria in suspension and you, you dip the uh, 
the diagnostic strip into it and it wakes up the moisture and then it can determine if it has that antigen by layering antibodies raised against that antigen. And the reason it's a layered test is the antibodies stick to the uh, presence of that particular antigen and then there are back, uh, the, there's a line of antibodies that are raised against the antibody <laughs> and it's got a label on it and then that's how you see it on that test, that it's a layered test. So what you're seeing, if it doesn't have that antibody sticking to the substrate or the, the antigen, then the secondary antibody won't stick and that's why you don't see the band. So the viewing of the band is due to another antibody raised to the antibody that's actually sticking to it. So um, anyhow, they attach the, uh, the portion that gives off that signal that lets you see it is on the, the constant region of that particular antibody. Pretty interesting. So it's an antibody antibody interaction, and I, I write a little bit about that, but that's what that's about. A little bit more detail on there, it just kind of goes over um, the details of that particular strip of that test. Very common. This philosophy, by the way, which I'm sorry that broke down, I, I may change that before I publish this. Um, I'll move these graphics over. Uh, but uh, the first and second band, they usually always give a test band. And so what they'll have on there is an antigen that they know that the antibody will react with and guaranteed on that strip. Then the other is a region where the, uh, the latex has um, receptors for the particular antigen out of the serum. So if it's present, it sticks to it. And then you see the antibodies on that, and then we layer them. But this is the same way a uh, pregnancy test would be run. It's the same philosophy. And when you get farther along in nursing, uh, it gets a little daunting when you have some of these tests they talk about. And there's only really two different types of tests. Keep reminding yourself, which test format is it falling under? Is it the latex test, layer the latex, or other? But to make it sound so confusing, and it's really only two different types of tests right now. So. Then we do the antibiotic uh, sensitivity assays. Uh, again, we're talking about strep. So we use these two antibiotics, the bacitracin and optogen, to identify organisms and uh, optogen and bacitracin now. Uh, now, I, I was always told never to use an antibiotic on a blood auger plate because there's things in blood that interfere. But this test is typically done on that. And so you can put the, um, the test on that. Uh, the lab I worked in, I had to always do it separately. Um, so I guess it was saving money for some other folks. Bacitracin, it also goes by the street name of Toxo A. Uh, when you get into uh, the pharmaceutical stuff uh, in your courses, uh, they have a street name or a standard uh, chemical name and then they have the company that produces it name. So there's three different names for each of these things. Um, but um, it's an antibiotic, it's an antimicrobial compound that's naturally produced by microorganisms produced by a bacillus lichen formis to act as a, uh, to interrupt formation of the bacteria cell wall. So there's a lot of ones that do that. Uh, so they're not effective against those that don't have cell walls like the, uh, uh, intracellular parasites. We're not worried about that. But it's useful in differentiating a beta hemolytic group A strep from beta hemolytic group. And that's important uh, because the uh, testing of group A strep and all that's expensive. Uh, if you're running thousands of tests, this is sort of the uh, precursor test. If it's, you want to confirm if it's uh, uh, bacitracin uh, resistant or not. Uh, streptococcus disease caused by group A strep. So bacitracin tests can also be used to differentiate bacitracin resistance uh, staph from bacitracin susceptible micrococcus. So it's one of the things. Uh, so what we, we use the resistance to uh, is uh, using a toxo is uh, the uh, strep A uh, strep. Uh, bacteria. Optogen is known. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to have you worry about 
of the chemical name for it. Uh, it inhibits the pneumococci, uh, does not affect other uh, hemolytic strep. So Optogen is really to identify Streptococcus pneumoniae. And it used to be, and it still is, you're going to find out every time the weather changes in the hospital, you're going to get elderly men coming in that uh, will have pneumonia. And there's a lot of reason, a lot of pre previous smokers and all that. Uh, but the, uh, the, 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 the usually you get the respiratory diseases that show up as changes of weather, hot to cold and cold to hot. And you'll see it. In hospitals, I used to uh, have to prepare crash carts. And uh, we, we knew that every time the season changed. So I put different things on the crash carts when we knew it was respiratory patients coming in. You know, so you'll get used to that stuff. Uh, so resistant agalacti for bacitracin. The reason I put this out, this is the key right there. That's why we use it. So I cut to the chase. You saw all the writing in the, in the typical lab manual, but they don't add this. And this is the key right here is why we do it, bacitracin. And we're looking for the resistance for agalacti because that's a hard one to identify. Then optogen, we look for the resistant. So we know the pneumonia is sensitive. All the other ones are resistant. So if it's sensitive, uh, it's, it's, it's a bad boy for pneumonia. So it's pretty straightforward. I just gave another example of that. So uh, catalase negative, so we know that they're all, you can make a presumptive test. In other words, based on any, nothing else other than the fact that it was catalase and it uh, may be gram stained, you can say you can make a, di a diagnostic ruling on that. But you usually, it's presumptive and you put it on the uh, documentation for the doctor that it's presumptive. They'll start an antibiotic testing, I mean, a, 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 a script for the patient and uh, then until more information comes in, at least we're doing something to try to stop the damage. Uh, YouTube, we're changing gears on gram-negative rods uh, and the GNR. And so these are gram-negatives. YouTube on the gram-negatives. Uh, usually we're talking about those that um, are gastrointestinal tract to humans, normal inhabitant for the gram-negative rods, uh, usually. Now, this is the labs that I worked in, was the, the enterics uh, most of the time. Uh, a, a veterinary technician has to be good on gram, both gram positive and gram negative. Humans are usually pick one. Um, the E. coli is the most common Escherichia coli. It's been studied for over 160, 70 years. Uh, it is a common uh, occurrence in our gut. It, causes, it, it does provide vitamin K for us which is used as clotting factor. It's important uh, in our blood. We have Christmas factor, you know, X uh, 10, 11, and 12, and vitamin K helps produce those clotting factors. Uh, normal inhabitant of the intestinal E. coli species is common cause of urinary tract infections, intestinal diseases, and other diseases uh, that are not associated with gastrointestinal. They can go into blood they can cause femur head necrosis. They can cause uh, lesions. Anywhere they go in the, the circulatory system, they've even been associated with meningitis. I mean, these E. coli are pretty flexible, and their whole purpose in life is to replicate and grow, and if it happens to kill you in the process, they don't care. Uh, so E. coli uh, is one that we, we want to get our hands on and understand it biochemically and genetically. I really wish uh, this course was a little bit more genetically oriented because uh, I would always minor, if you get a chance to minor in anything, I would minor in genetics because that's the future. It's, uh, it's already flushing out old time physicians that they're so old now they don't, they don't want to go back to school to learn about genetics and they just retire. So you're, you're going to see a lot more very spry physicians that know their molecular genetics. Um, Enterobacter erogenes, it's typically referred to as a fecal coliform. It's a leading cause of noscommal infections. Uh, and unfortunately, urinary and respiratory, uh, so hospital acquired uh, Enterobacter erogenes. Citrobacter friandi, 
uh, it's found in the environment. It's pretty much everywhere. Uh, it, uh, uh, it's an opportunistic. Uh, it's also not as common associated, but usually we see it showing up in the urinary tract. Uh, usually citrobacter causes the inflammation, but it doesn't do as much damage to the kidneys as uh, like some of the other organisms that are typical, like uh, E. coli cause damage to kidneys. Klebsiella pneumoniae, uh, I'll just tell you right off the bat, Klebsiella produces a lot of polysaccharide on a plate. It really looks like somebody blew their nose on a plate. It's really nasty. But uh, it's a normal flora of the skin. Uh, it's not usually a pathogen, but they are well suited for uh, respiratory infections, believe it or not. And a lot of times in heavy smokers or folks that have been around dust and pollen and that sort of thing, um, the Klebsiellas can show up. Uh, urinary tract, uh, usually associated with catheterized patients. And again, it's not using good aseptic technique. Salmonella species, skin, it's a close cousin to E. coli, uh, but salmonella, um, uh, and you see kids handling and kissing, you know, their, their turtles and things, and it just absolutely makes me go crazy because uh, salmonella is really nasty. You can go uh, to the blood. You can get uh, intestinal types of disturbances that lead to blood in the stool and vomiting. So you're using the commode and you're holding a trash can at the same time. And it's usually six to eight hours after exposure. But the problem with this one is it's not toxin-based, it's organism-based. It gets in the blood, it will kill you. And so especially with children, I don't, I never play around with seminal infection because once these live organisms get in the blood, there's no telling what they can do. Uh, there's other strains of salmonella is uh, Typhimurium and Enteritidis, and they're very common, uh, causing uh, uh, gastrointestinal type of diseases, usually by bad hand washing techniques, and children will reinfect themselves with these, Enteritidis usually. Um, it's usually self-limiting too. They have to have the constant influx in order to make uh, it work. Typhi, uh, Salmonella typhi is only found in humans and causes uh, of typhoid fever. And uh, you might recognize the name by another one that causes a typhus like disease. Uh, Salmonella acquired the genes for it and uh, they produce, so they have a typhoid like fever, diarrhea, and inflammation of the spleen, uh, and other forms of inflammation. Usually they don't talk about it, but the kidneys get damaged. Uh, from this organism in meningitis. Proteus, usually Proteus virabilis, or uh, there's some other strains, but Proteus uh, is in the GI tract. It grows extremely fast and it's highly mobile. So uh, Proteus mirabilis and vulgaris, if you drive by a, a sewage treatment plant and it stinks to holy heaven, uh, it's Proteus uh, vulgaris, it's vulgar. And that's why it earned its name, actually. It's a really awful smelling organism. Uh, but if they don't have the money, you can tell if your township is slowing or there is fiscal cash, they don't have the desensitizers, the odor eliminators in the uh, sewage treatment. And uh, wow, it's bad. I, don't, I feel for the people that have to work there. Uh, other unknowns uh, that are also uh, part of what they call the uh, it can cause enterotoxigenic or interinvasive type, but they're usually non enterobacteriaceae So all the ones I talked about are referred to as the enter, uh, enterobacteriaceae uh, right here. So they are the ones that cause the gastrointestinal tract problem. Campylobacter species, you will run across this. It used to be, we only saw it in the animal field, uh, in the veterinary side, but Campylobacter jejuni and others uh, and coli are really nasty. Uh, usually it, uh, animals get another fecal material and they don't, you know, they don't know anything better. But um, usually if humans are handling animals and farmers and stuff, uh, they can get Campylobacter and usually uh, really uh, wish they hadn't. Um, 
infections are zoonotic. So it's human zoonotic is a standard term. And we've learned a lot about that with this viral infection because uh, it, it crossed and they're not really sure. The last I heard was bats, but I don't know now. Uh, what, what do we believe anymore? Uh, zoonotic. So it goes from uh, animal to human or human to animal. And when I was at Welcome, that's what my expertise was. I studied to see, I developed genetic tests to determine if an organism could pass from a human to an animal or an animal, and it was bacterial. And um, it's, it's really interesting. They're totally genetically distinct organisms if they don't pass from uh, human to animal, but they share genes of the same type if they are zoonotic. It's really interesting. Uh, so, Campylobacter infections, uh, diarrhea, it's usually, the key with this one is blood, uh, like salmonella. A Campylobacter is, it has an awful smell too, just in itself. Uh, anyhow, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Pseudomonas is an interesting organism. I wish I could have shown it to you in the lab. Uh, if you need to go, by the way, it, I won't be insulted. I know it's at three o'clock now, but it's fine. I paid for the license to Zoom, so uh, it used to be I was limited to 40 minutes, but uh, I forget that. <laughs> uh, ubiquitous in the environment. The Pseudomonas is burn patient, usually. And the organism produces a characteristic greenish tint. It's the only organism I'm aware of that does that. So if your bandages smell sicky, sweet, awful smell, uh, it's pseudomonas, and it has a greenish tint. So if you see bandages with greenish tint, uh, that's pretty much all you need to tell me. They got a pseudomonal infection, and they can be really nasty. Uh, they produce toxins and other things uh, that go into their blood. They're also famous for biofilms. Uh, so they, uh, in a non-burn patient's urinary tract and respiratory is what you'll see most of the time. So that's, you know, those are the, the gram negatives that we worry about. I just wanted to give you uh, an example. Now here is a, def a definitive chart, and I'll provide this for you so you'll have it. But uh, this might be something that I would give you. Uh, see how this works out here. If you notice, I have all these different organisms listed at the top, and a lot of uh, all of these are your gram negatives, GNR type. Down here are various tests, a lot of tests we never, we, we've never even run. But what I wanted to show you is this is how we distinguish or detect bacteria and be able to name them based on them on their own, revealing to me based on various uh, uh, differential tests on how they grow. And let's say uh, you have these tests and you've got uh, the ones that we ran, um, citrate. And here's positive, uh, I mean a negative, positive, positive. And we wanted to see if it was E. coli on citrate was negative. And if you remember the citrate test, it's normally uh, green and a positive test turns blue. So this would stay green. So you would, uh, to identify E. coli, you'd see it's negative and you had a negative test for citrate. And let's say um, you had a, a um, McConkie auger and the key f feature in McConkie auger is lactose and it, it turns dark purple so we know it's positive for lactose. Now you know E. coli. Now you've got two points. You've got a positive test here and a negative test here. You're well on your way to identifying it as E. coli. Usually three tests will do it and uh, if they're all consistent. And if it ferments glucose, so you have your TSI and I'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, is positive for glucose, uh, then we're, I would probably delineate it. Uh, uh, it's a Ka or whatever, and uh, you can identify that as a glucose fermenter. And then you've identified E. coli as your unknown. And it's just based on tests. You don't have to memorize this chart. I provide this. It's really up to you to just interpret the test. Is it a positive? Is a blue tube for citrate? You know it was citrate positive. And that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, that's that's a very common thing. So let's go over that. Um, the test uh, that I made reference to here is there's a YouTube that talks about the McConkie. It's really a good uh, a little video. 
Now, things I wanted you to know, uh, and I think I've gone over this one time, but that's fine. Uh, what makes the McConkey auger work the way it is, uh, it's selected because it has crystal violet and bile salts. And uh, their gram positives can't deal with the crystal violet because it clogs the peptidoglycan layer because the crystal violet, we know the gram positive because the crystal violet binds to the outer membrane, or the, 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 uh, that uh, thick layer. And so what it does, it clogs the pores. They can't, they can't get nutrients in and kills it. And so it's selective. So we add bile salts and crystal violet in a McConkie. So we're getting gram negatives. And then we look at its ability to ferment lactose. And, uh, and it does it differently. If you look here, the colony actually changes color. And if it doesn't, it stays at the clear color. So uh, normally the media is, is a pH indicator in the media, but it's this is the only case that I know of uh, other than, well, there's a few other places, but we don't work with those. Uh, but the colony actually changes color, not the media, which is kind of cool. So, um, and this was a typo I saw. Um, the non-lactose fermenters will utilize uh, uh, peptone yielding an alkaline reaction that changes the color of the medium, uh, clear or yellow, uh, which is true, uh, but the lactose fermenters will appear pink. It's not pink, they're red. Okay, and I, I don't know how many times, this has been in a lab manual for years, and I put in um, uh, changes and I never seem to get changed. But anyhow, it's not a big deal. You see the plates with it. Citrate test couldn't be any easier. Normal media is green, turns blue is positive. General rule of thumb, uh, I've already kind of gone over, but uh, this is a blue. And both of the uh, indole test and oxidase test positives are blue. And so it, it, if you're not sure, guess blue. <laughs> uh, triple sugar. I have a YouTube on it. They did an excellent job on this YouTube. And it's only, I don't know, eight minutes long. And uh, I just need to learn to talk faster, I guess. I don't know. Um, but the key to this test is really clever test. It has three sugars. Lactose and sucrose are ten times the concentration than glucose. And the reason they do that is glucose is the most common. Of course, glucose is the sugars that usually get plugged in in the energy transport chain like right away. Uh, but what we're after really are those that are using lactose and sucrose, table sugar. And if they, uh, they're pigs, they'll go after the higher concentration first if they can. And if they can't, then they start using glucose, but it's in a lower concentration. So what that means is, uh, it's the color changes uh, if it doesn't have as much on there they tend not to turn the whole tube a color because the concentration is so low um, versus if they use the other sugars it, it just turns the whole thing yellow quickly and so that's kind of the basis for the, the changes in the test but we also uh, stab these tubes now these are made by molten uh, auger media that has the TSI components to it, and they're uh, leaned at, uh, at a couple of degrees when we just let them cool in a rack, and that's how they form these, these types of slants, they call these, and, um, and so anyhow, um, so uh, these would be called KK. Now, in my lab, when I used to have a diagnostic lab, it was, uh, I just call it red, red, because that's the color. There is no difference. I don't know why they do that. It's German, I think, is what I was told once. And so they used in this prevention, convention, so I'm going to stick with it, Ka. So the top is K, but it's at the top of the equation. And then the lower the butt is the, uh, the A part, which is yellow acid. So they used the terminology A for acid, which will turn it yellow. In my lab, I called it red-yellow, but hey, you know, um, let's not be obvious. We want to make it hard, right? So K is red, uh, A is uh, yellow. AA would be yellow, yellow. And this produces gas. You see the void? Now, how did we get that gas? 
it's all about how we inoculate the tube. So all TSIs, the only one that I know of that we would purposely do this, is to use your normal inoculation loop, and you go into the tube, aseptically, of course, so you uh, fire up your loop and uh, open the tube. Um, I mean, go to your plate first to get your bacteria. Open the tube and then flame the tube. Go into the tube and you stab it. And you don't go all the way to the bottom, but most, you know, like 99% of the way down with your loop and then pull it out. And then when you pull it out, you go at the bottom and just finish uh, streaking it right on the surface of that slant up and you're done. So you flame the top again, close the top, and then flame your loop and you're done. But the idea is that you've introduced bacteria into the bulk of the media. And what happens is that they start producing a gas by breaking down, it's usually always yellow when they do it, um, it'll start breaking up the media and it's a characteristic and uh, so we can use that. So it's AA plus gas. The other feature of this is the iron part of it and uh, it uh, has the production of hydrogen sulfide and anytime you see sulfur in a chemical reaction, when we see it, it turns black. Sulfur like charcoal, uh, you start to see it. Now someone asked a question, it's a very good question to ask. If I incubate this tube for a long time, it turns really dark and it'll cover most of the bottom of the tube. So you can't tell if it's uh, Ka or whatever. Uh, so they, the typical diagnostic lab will pull the tubes uh, out at uh, like 10 hours and look at the tubes to see if they have any of the uh, hydrogen sulfide and denote the color of the tube and then incubate them again, finish them out. And uh, just to make sure that they can determine it's AA or whatever it is. And there's the test results and you can come follow the convention. And so they usually refer to the bottom of the tube as a butt and the top of the tube. So the top and bottom and that's the convention I'll use uh, in a lab practice. You, urea broth couldn't be any easier, you just inoculate. They come negative with nothing, they're clear. And if they're positive, uh, they turn this uh, pillow kitty color. They're really um, bright, it's extremely bright. It's, the picture doesn't even do it. it. It's amazing how bright it is. YouTube does, it does a good job. And you can look at that if you're interested. Urea broth, so it's Essentially, uh, like urine, it's urea from urine, and pH indicator phenol red. Here's that phenol red again. Uh, so it's it's a really an acid acid environment that will change. And so urease activity, the media turns that hot pink. Okay, so if the urease, the enzyme urease is there, it converts that urea. Um, and if it doesn't have the enzyme then it retains that tan color, so that's all. And there's, if you look, the reason that we're running that test, of course, and then we'll go back wherever it is, that chart, and it just helps us to uh, identify, uh, I don't know if the urea is on this one or not, it should be a very common test. Of course, I pull one that doesn't, but it'll be on your chart. And you just look at look for a urease test, and if it's positive or negative, whatever. It just helps you in the, in the identification. Indole test, you can just get a little bit of bacteria colony, and you drip the uh, reagent, and see if it has tryptophanase. And if it does, then it looks for tryptophan, and in the presence of tryptophanase, it cleaves it to an indole, and the, the reagent will turn it uh, blue if it's present or not. It's not, and it doesn't change color. The oxidase test, uh, pretty common. It's part of the um, electron transport chain in bacteria that makes, of course, the ATP. Um, it's the hydrogens that charge uh, the ATP, uh, the ATPase to spin. But anyhow, we look for this. Again, it's an enzyme. And uh, so electron carrier proteins, final electron transport tra chain, uh, many bacteria capable of cellular respiration have electron transport chain. All bacteria, not all the bacteria, have the cytochrome uh, uh, C oxidase. They have different ones. So this test runs for the, the cytochrome C. And the bottom line is um, 
the the key is that the in the presence of this oxidase, uh, the reagent color comes out blue, and so you can report um, oxidase tests in blue. It's positive. It's negative. It doesn't change. And it's just one more point on that chart to uh, um, identify it. Now, the last exercise is really easy, uh, and we use its ability to utilize oxygen to help to, uh, identify these. But the bad boys on this one is, uh, this is a code brown right here in hospitals typically, C. diff. Um, and I think I already told the story that I drove up to a place where my mom was uh, rehabilitating, and I, I said, oh my God, out of the parking lot, that's C. diff, clearly, it smells the high heavens, awful. Anyhow, I went in, it was my mom, and they had just left her in her own stuff, and uh, I had to call emergency transport to get her over to the hospital. Um, but uh, anyhow, that was <laughs> bad. C. diff is unique. Uh, usually, if patients have seen a high uh, tetracycline or some sort of antibiotic treatment, and it shows you, it selects, it kills all the other ones. So C. diff is resistant to it typically, a lot of antibiotics. So it grows uncontrollably, and we get a C. diff, and it causes this, uh, not just diarrhea, explosive diarrhea. Uh, I was an orderly at Moore Memorial, and I used to clean walls with this stuff. It was terrible. It's so embarrassing for the patient and all that. It's just really nasty. But uh, if you ever run across it, uh, I feel sorry for you. You will. Uh, and you chose this profession, too. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> just joking. Uh, so it's diarrhea, fever, and loss of appetite. The problem is, in the elderly that get this, a lot of them can't stand the loss of appetite. Uh, it's a death sentence. Um, usually, they're already on, the, as, as one of the doctors so inappropriately put it, the swirl in the toilet. Uh, when it's usually a patient that's broken a hip, and they're already now not exercising, doing proper things, and then they'll get C. diff, and uh, it's like the final blow. And you do everything you can to try to prevent this from happening. It's Usually, it's the, the last straw type thing and causes death. Um, patients, unfortunately, I hate it, but it's what happens. C. perfringens, clostridium perfringens. If you ever run across uh, somebody that has gas gangrene, because that's what that is, uh, and you will grant these uh, type 2 diabetics in, in, invariably will get gas gangrene of the feet and hands, usually the feet first. And you know it's perfringens, there's no mistake. The smell from perfringens is unique and god awful. It is, it, it makes clostridium difficile nothing. It, it's that bad. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a strict anaerobe. It's uh, pretty nasty. Um, so perfringent is very common in type 2 diabe uh, diabetics. Let's see, unfortunately. Botulinum, if you use uh, uh, Botox, uh, it's botulinum toxin, uh, but they've weaponized it. Or the botulinum, uh, they call it um, uh, some, uh, X squared or whatever they call the weaponized version. You can kill millions of people with this toxin. It's that bad. But it causes food poisoning. If you see a can of vegetables or something at a grocery store and the can's deformed because it started to, to bulge, uh, most likely it's clostridium botulinum. It's a strict anaerobe and it will do that. Folks at home can that don't follow the procedures properly will get it. Um, and it's usually this type of food poisoning is deadly. So anyhow, tetani, clostridium tetanus, it's a soil microorganism and you can pick it up in the soil and it's phorogenes, produces spores and you can see the little spores and they usually have a shape that looks like this. It looks like a key, but the idea is it has that dark, dark spore. This is what caused the revenge in a lot of the Egyptian mummies and things. They, oh my gosh, I broke the so-and-so rule. No, you open the dirty bandages and they got into the air and you breathed it in and you got uh, um, sporogenes or the uh, um, botulinum toxin and it uh, doesn't take long to kill you. So air tolerance, um, there's a YouTube on uh, running these tests, really easy, but what we do, is 
the key is that we have the glove boxes. Um, you exchange inf uh, the, the, the plates and things in here. Then you flood it with nitrogen gas. And then using these gloves, you can open the door, manipulate them, and that's what a glove box does. Or you can use a cheap one and just flood the gas in here with a little generator packet. You, you add water to it and throw it in there, and it allows the bacteria anaerobes to grow. And you can read through this material through the graphs and charts, but the key graph are these two here. And if you look at the types, the obligate aerobes, and you see uh, they have to have the oxygen, so they grow at the, the top of the tube. Facultative will grow pretty much anywhere in the tube. They have a little bit of a fluid at the top. It's kind of misleading. that seals the tube. Uh, a little bit, so it causes the air diffusion uh, to decrease a lot, so that's kind of mis misleading. Uh, obligate anaerobe, they're as far as away from the oxygen as they can possibly be, and the ones that can deal with the air with just small amounts, uh, they go as far as away as they can, or they kind of grow. This tube's old because you can see a little bit of growth there, but without any befuddlement of real data, here's sort of the breakdown. Obligate anaerobes, uh, or aerobes, excuse me, obligate aerobes at the top. Obligate anaerobes just as far as away as they can from the source of the oxygen, so they're at the bottom. Facultative doesn't really matter where they are, but they typically choose oxygen first, and if they have to, reluctantly, they'll grow anaerobically, but they prefer not to. You can see they don't grow down at the bottom. Uh, air tolerant anaerobes, they can grow anaerobically or aerobically. They don't really care. They have the ability to do both. If you notice, uh, they don't prefer it. They just can tolerate it. Now, what you don't know, or you may know, is that a obligate anaerobe, if they ever see oxygen, when I'm trying to grow them, for an example, uh, it'll kill them dead on a doornail. They, if they get exposed to air, they're dead. That's just kind of how it is. So, um, uh, so the micro air files, uh, they small amount of air. If you notice, it's a little bit different the way you saw this tube here. Now, um, I can argue with this tube. This is dead bacteria here. So this tube's old, but they typically micro air files will grow right at the top, very similar to the obligate aerobes. They can tol tolerate small amounts. Uh, it's a band is thinner than the uh, obligate uh, air road. So the span is a little bit wider. This is narrower. It's kind of subjective, but anyhow, that's what's going on. And uh, so I would use this chart to study this one. Uh, I'm not going to, to give you a real set of tubes because sometimes they're hard to interpret. Uh, I'm more after the theory behind it. God, who's after me? Uh, and so this kind of just talks about it. Um, I wouldn't worry about that page. And I believe that's it. That is the uh, lab practical. Any questions? What do we I did want to ask if it was possible to, I know some people might want to take it next week, the practical instead. I do already have four exams next week. Okay. So is there a way to like just broaden the window instead yeah. of blocking off to just yeah. next week? Just leave it open, sure. Okay. Awesome, thank you. Uh, yeah, so what I was, uh, so what I'm gonna do is to have it so that during the time that it's open, you can go back and change your answers. So you can review them, but um, you can only take it once though. Uh, sometimes you can go back and take it again and uh, my management doesn't want me to do that. So it's, it's one time, but it'll be open for that whole hour. So you can go back and change whatever you want. The, the practice exam I gave you didn't have that characteristic. Uh, you couldn't go back and change your answer. So I'm, uh, the software can do it. I just turn it on. So uh, that'll be it. So, yeah, I can just turn it on for the entire time so I could extend it. Awesome. Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you. One of the features of having an online class uh, that uh, we can do that. Is there yeah. uh, yeah, anyone else that has any um, comments or what you want me to cover on a lab practical review? Did you say you were going to post a voiceover? Yes. I'm, I'm actually, I haven't made it yet, um, but I'm going to do that right after we finish. Okay. Yep. 
And so that should help those who haven't attended that they'll have that. And what I'll do is I'll just open it up. If I can find my notes now for the sheet that I started with, wherever I put that. Yeah, here we go. This one. Uh, so what I'll do is the lab practical will start on the 29th, and I'll just let it run until the end of the 5th. Awesome. That would be great. Yep. And uh, I've never done this logistically before, but uh, uh, you'll take advantage of my stupidity if it doesn't work out right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, that's that's what I'll do. Open it up. And it gives you the maximum flexibility. Why not leverage some of the flexibilities that we do have? I mean, my God, you know, we've done everything else. So if, uh, and that shouldn't affect anyone. If you already plan to take it then, so that would be great. I did move it for my biology 110. Um, boy, what a disaster. That is a train wreck going down the line for those folks. They tend not to like biology as it is. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, I do that. And uh, any other questions? If not, and then um, uh, I think we've covered the lab practical pretty well. So while I got you here still, we get some free polling. Um, I've been trying to figure out what to do on the final exam and what I guess I'm going to do is to put all the previous exams uh, that, that you've had in a PDF so it's just the, the normal exam and then separate to that will be the answers and then I'll just make you swear up and down that you won't put that in social media because you need your old exams to study from would you agree with that? And so I think that's important. And I gotta figure out how to do that. I may password protect it or something or something like that, I don't know. Because my boss is real sensitive about that. But he's flexible because of the, where we are. But um, anyhow, that's the plan. I, I really want you to be able to go over your old exams because it is a comprehensive final. And then I'll hold a review for exam three um, early on in the week. Okay. Thank you, Dr. V. My pleasure. And Thank I'll get you. Out as fast as I can. <laughs>